Dr. Jan Harmpool was born in 1942 in a small town in the Netherlands on a dairy farm. He did complete his veterinary school program in the Netherlands, graduating from there in 1970. After graduation as a veterinarian, he moved to Michigan and worked for other veterinary practices for a decade before he started working for himself. Pohl Veterinary Services was started in 1981, and ever since then, Dr. Pohl worked as a solely dairy veterinarian, meaning that he only saw a certain type of cow that's used for milk production and that all of the veterinary work he did was on that type of cow. I wasn't able to figure out how the Nat Geo show started, but the first episode aired October 29th, 2011. In 2012, Dr. Poole was fined and his license was put on probation because of a terrible case that happened with a pregnant dog. The client was calling the clinic over and over and over again saying, hey, my dog is past her due date and she has discharge coming from her vulva. Eventually, the client brought the dog in anyway and Dr. Pohl did an ultrasound, claimed that he could see the puppies were still alive. The puppies were not alive. He was found negligent and guilty of not meeting the current standard of care because of this case. Another case was brought against him in 2015. In this situation, an enucleation removal of an eyeball was done on a brachycephalic dog. There were a number of major problems. First, sterile techniques were not used and Dr. Pohl was just using paper towel to dab at the surgery site. He was not wearing a cap to keep hair out of the surgery site. He was not wearing a surgery gown and the procedure was not at all sterile. The other huge concern was that proper anesthesia was not used. This dog should have been intubated, especially since brachycephalic dogs struggle to breathe and it wasn't done, which is a huge problem. There was an immense lack of care shown for that dog. Now this lawsuit was appealed and Dr. Pohl was successful with the appeal. Because of a technicality, the court decided there is no law in Michigan stating that a veterinarian needs to perform sterile surgeries. This makes me incredibly frustrated. You know, there are going to be, of course, on a farm, some scenarios where you're doing the best you can to be sterile, but there might be flies that you can't control or something else happens that's out of your control with weather. But when you're inside a veterinary clinic, doing a surgical procedure, there's really no excuse not to be giving your patients sterile surgery procedures. The incidence of infection and complications and harm to the patients is going to be incredibly high when those very basic principles aren't followed. Dr. Pohl explains that his style is common sense veterinary medicine, but the truth is what's shown on TV is outdated. It doesn't anywhere near come close to the current standard of care of veterinary medicine, which is an embarrassment to the rest of the field. It's also harmful for the patients. One thing I wasn't able to find information on was why he decided to start seeing horses and dogs and other companion animals now that he has a TV show. He practiced dairy bovine medicine for decades and there's no evidence anywhere that he even tried to update his knowledge in other areas of veterinary medicine before starting to see all of these patients. And the other compounding factor is that for the longest time, Michigan didn't have any continuing education requirements for veterinarians, zero. And you can tell. Now, to be fair to the state of Michigan, they did change this in 2016. Michigan does require 45 hours of continuing education every three years. The way that Dr. Pohl practices is appalling to those of us 
who have worked hard to keep up as veterinary medicine changes and as we learn how to do better for our patients. The list of concerning issues regarding episodes that he's put out are, are too numerous to count, but a lot of them fall under that same umbrella of a lack of pain management, a lack of proper anesthetic, and a lack of sterile procedures. There was also a puppy brought in who had been mauled. It was put into a cage and it died. There was a dog with a GI obstruction that ended up dying. It wasn't given rehydration efforts like IV fluids. It wasn't given an, a foreign body surgery. Just atrocious. Most veterinarians who practice in general practice have developed excellent skills at learning how to work within the constraints that are around us. And these constraints are numerous. It could be a problem that we do not have access to a specialist that would be best for treating a case. And I have this happen regularly. So then I will do my best, but with the clear communication that I'm not the best person to be seeing for this patient. But there are plenty of cases where me doing the best I can, consulting with the specialist over the phone or whatever the case might be, is going to be better than doing nothing. We also often, as GP veterinarians, work within immense financial constraints. With that said, it's never appropriate to not give pain medication. We have to control our patient's pain. It's cruel and unethical not to, and we have so many medication options for pain management at this point. It's really not hard to do. There's also never an excuse to not be using sterile technique when performing surgical procedures on our patients. It's not like Michigan is an underdeveloped country. He's not practicing in the middle of a war zone. I mean, I can think of some very severe situations where sterile technique might be impossible, but he is not in one of those situations. There's no reason to be practicing poor quality medicine. Cheaper veterinary medicine does not have to be equivalent with, with causing patient pain and suffering. There's just no excuse for it. I can think of two reasons why someone might practice this way. Either they want the profit margins, so they are charging similar amounts to what other veterinarians are charging that are using sterile technique and that are giving patients pain medication. That way they have better profits in their practice or they are ignorant or incompetent and should not be doing this type of veterinary medicine. I did watch some of the Yukon vet before and that was a much better representation of what veterinary medicine can be in very rural communities that have a lot of constraints. Here, what do you want? Okay, so that's an incredibly bad idea. In there, there looks like there's some chocolate and there's often uh, artificial sugars like xylitol, which can be deadly for dogs. Why would you do this? Why? There are so many dog treats. Offer a dog treat, offer some canned food, for Pete's sake. Big one, don't sniff them all. Here, don't feed any to the dog, otherwise I'll see him tomorrow. It, exactly, so why would you offer the dog the bowl? What if the dog had grabbed one and swallowed it? I was thinking about getting Beth uh, a Great Dane. You already got her a goat. I know. She's never raised a Great Dane puppy before. Oh my gosh. And I think it's a pretty special experience. I In general, giving animals as a gift is never, ever, ever recommended. I can't tell you how many times people come in with gifts of animals that they're unprepared to care for, they don't have the budget for, they don't have the time for, and then what suffers? The animal. The animal suffers. Don't give animals as gifts. I kind of like the black ones. Mm -hmm. After all, Beth did marry into a Great Dane family. I want to surprise Beth, but I also don't want to get in trouble because I picked a dog that she doesn't like. That is another very good reason. You might pick a dog that they wouldn't prefer. Don't do it. Do not give animals as gifts. Don't do it. 
<laughs> you uh, better be careful. Since I had talked to Beth about the possibility of getting a puppy, I thought surprising her with it would be okay. Hello. No, no, it's not okay. Oh, these are the guys, huh? Oh, super cute. Temperament is really important. And these puppies all appear to be quite fearful. So that should be a no right away. It's just feeling the puppies out, you know, seeing which one was the match for me. He's the smallest male that we have. Okay, the runt of the men. So they're all super cute, but I think he is pretty perfect. I think my wife would be very happy with this, although she doesn't know. So doing this is ethical breeders will not sell a puppy to someone who has this story. They just wouldn't do it. Please see my series on how to find ethical dog breeders. I've done some videos on it. You should not just on a whim go to some random person's house and surprise your partner with a puppy. This is really cool. I've always wanted to surprise somebody with a puppy. <sighs> You're so scared. He's Yep. Yes, this puppy is scared, and that is not gonna bode well as this dog grows. At this age, this puppy should be exploring everything, happy about everything, excited about everything, not so fearful that it can't move. Not scared. He was the most chill and quietest puppy of the bunch. Nope. Oh, He's I, scared. I him out. You're never ready for a pup because every pup is different. Hiccup, hiccups, yep. That's a good sign. That means the heart is growing. But if. Nope. There's nothing proving that at all. Not at all. Nope. They want a pup. Now they better do it when the two of them are there so that they can just work with it. Is that warmer? Yeah. I know my fingers don't taste good, huh? It takes a firm hand and a lot of smarts you know, just to train the puppy. Nope. It doesn't. I have done a bunch of videos on ethical research-based current behavior modification. I will link them in the video description. The fact that they are promoting this as something that you should do is a problem. You should not be gifting animals. Don't do it. Just don't do it. My dad gave him a, a, a poor gross bone. Oh no. Uh, almost the size of a tennis ball. Oh. I'm pretty sure he swallowed the whole thing. Okay, why don't we get him up on the scale? A cooked bone that big can split into numerous shards and tear up Rocky's stomach. Yep. I got up this morning and he was yiping and um, I've, uh, it's lodged in this intestine somewhere and I just had to hurry up and call Dr. Paul. When did he eat this? Uh, last night about 5 o'clock. Okay, put him on the table. Let's start from the back end. Okay. If the bones are fried, cooked or braised or whatever, it becomes calcified more. They sliver and have sharp points. You okay, buddy? Dog's not okay, no. Was he eating this morning or no. not? Nothing. Rocky's been yelping in pain and could I'll be bet. suffering from internal injuries. He yelped after, so most likely what he tried to do is swallow too big a bone and hurt his throat. Didn't stick in his throat. Hey, my suggestion, let's take an x-ray. Okay. See what's there. When he swallowed it and it went to his stomach, David was wondering if that would be safe. No. X rays will Don't give your dog's bones. Damage the bone caused. Thorax, abdomen, everything. And whether Rocky needs surgery. If he has to have surgery, then he's going to have to have surgery. Leave him here and come with me. Stay here, Rocky. Hey. You should not leave a painful patient unattended when they have an obstruction in loose in a room wearing a leash and, and a flat collar. Like, what? Don't do that. Well, you should Oi. Bones, but nothing is bad. Okay. They're right at the back end already. Oh, really? They're already going down the tube. He'll take care of them today. Okay. Nothing hurt. Okay. He ate bone, but it's digested already. Okay. Just turn him loose and let him run rabbits. No. This dog is exceptionally painful and is constipated 
and is having a hard time passing all of those bone shards. What needs to be done is appropriate pain management. If there's any dehydration, you need to rehydrate the dog and you need to offer, depending on the situation, medication to help them pass the bowel movement or enemas, those sorts of things. You don't just give no pain medication and turn them loose. Don't feed bones, period. Don't feed bones, period, exactly. That dog also is morbidly obese and needs to be on a weight loss plan today. Beagles are also prone to having neck issues. This dog should not be walking on a flat collar. It should be on a harness. So after watching this episode, that's from five months ago, what it seems like is that there is an immense lack of pain management and sedation and medication for fear and anxiety. The animals all look incredibly stressed. They're handled roughly and poorly. I will never watch more of this. There's no point. I really wish that the show would just be taken off the air. It seems like Nat Geo has a trend of promoting out of date people who are an embarrassment to the industries that they are in. I would love to hear from you what popular person you'd like me to cover next. Feel free to comment it and I will add them to my list for future videos. This week's comment that I want to highlight is this wonderful feedback. Thank you so much. I do read every comment that you leave for me and I appreciate hearing from all of you. I do put out a new video most Fridays and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.